Welcome back everyone to our AWS coverage here on location in Las Vegas. This is theCUBE's 11th year covering reInvent. It's always our favorite event. It's our largest event ever here at uh, reInvent for theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, your host with Dave Vellante. And the tradition is at the end of every show, Andy Jassy would come by, but since Andy's not the CEO anymore and Adam's busy, Swami, thanks for coming by and, and holding the line for representing AWS to come on, join theCUBE for our, our close and wrap up. Oh, my pleasure, really glad to be here. And, and we're a huge fan. You're a real big supporter of theCUBE. You come on when, we, on when you have news. The Hugging yeah. Face news was big in February and other showcases we've done. And, and uh, the work you're doing is great. The keynote was amazing. So you give a keynote on day two. Um, a lot of people were like blown away. <laughs> like, okay, wait a minute. Generate AI strategy, there it is. Laid out Adam the day before. So congratulations and, yeah. and, and thanks for coming on theCUBE. Uh, no, thank you. That is actually, we are super excited about uh, all the things we launched as well, because uh, if you see AWS strategy with generative AI is um, really resonating with customers in a big way, and uh, we are already seeing like customers in every industry, from healthcare like Pfizer to FinTech with Intuit to travel, and booking.com to so many industries, they are already innovating, but also not just at uh, the yeah. models level, but even at the infrastructure yeah. level to application levels, um, and uh, very, very excited to so see. So I have to ask you, because it was someone we've yeah. been talking a lot about, in February when you were on the queue, when, when you ex yeah. announced your expanded Hugging face relationship, I asked you, because we've been following you guys, we know you've been doing machine yeah. learning and AI for a very long time, so we were out there holding the line for you, but given the, the generative AI hype that, that happened, you guys had to kind of go, okay, this is game time, so game on, a little bit of a challenge from the industry, a lot's been happening. You guys have infused generative into almost every, almost everything, if not everything. Can you scope out like the size of the, of the infusion? I mean, pretty much your keynote was pretty much all existing services with now Gen AI. It wasn't a pivot because you kind of just had to retool. How much of that was going on? Can you give us a, a size of, a scope of like the magnitude of like what happened? Because last year we talked about LLMs a little bit, but it wasn't yeah. like on the stage, it wasn't in the announcements. Yeah. And this year you got a stack, every product's got, you got Q, you got, yeah. I mean everything's been, I wouldn't say, transformed. Uh, uh, sure, I mean, first of all, uh, as you rightly pointed out, uh, we have been doing AI and ML for like 25 years, and uh, we have been actually using LLMs internally for uh, quite a while. If you see Amazon.com, we rolled out an LLM powered uh, personalization and search experience uh, even before generative AI was cool, and it did really wonders for our uh, improving our customer uh, search relevance. Let alone in 2020, we rolled out uh, QuickSight Q uh, to do natural language based uh, querying of dashboards. Uh, but as we were exploring and these models internally were getting more and more powerful, we started investing in all layers of the stack. I mean, even more than six years ago, we launched custom silicon. So this is, stack is not something we just uh, suddenly invented this year. <laughs> this has been in the making, but, uh, but the key thing was that um, this is what sets AWS apart. We first uh, launch stuff when it is ready, but we also don't just uh, give answer to only one customer persona, which is like, hey, I have a model and an API, we are done. We are actually innovating in every layer of the stack, but uh, at the infrastructure layer, uh, we have been investing with our strategic collaboration with NVIDIA, which we expanded with our GPU-based instances to custom silicon with uh, Trainium and Inferentia let alone all the innovations we're doing in the software stack with SageMaker, with things like HyperPod, which decrease the training time by up to 40%. So this has really been a game changer for the likes of perplexity, AI stability, or AI21, to even uh, Autodesk and many others. If, so you go many back, if you go back six months, I just want to ask you, look at stability AI and some of the image stuff that's going on. Yeah. Six to eight months ago to do that kind of computation would have been mind boggling. What's the step function increase has been happening? Because there's been massive improvement on just say image generation. I know, so the, one of the things is, uh, even two years ago when people talk about uh, what LLMs are, that means they typically do like a uh, training run that is usually in the order of maybe one or two weeks. Now, a typical training run goes uh, probably in the order of uh, a few months. Uh, and uh, that is another reason why, as the scale of these training jobs increase, the complexity also increases, which is where you, uh, I talked about yesterday, why you 
need to do like constant checkpointing and why you need to do better failure detection, why you need to do automatic distribution, which led to things like Hyperpods, as an example, with SageMaker. So, and um, this is, uh, again, uh, an example of just even focusing on that persona, what you need to innovate. Um, and uh, now the same thing happens in Bedrock as well. Uh, when we think of, uh, I mean, having yeah. you all built uh, your own Gen AI app at Cube AI, yeah. so yeah. you know, so yeah. building a Gen AI app is a lot more than just actually taking an uh, LLM and actually plugging it through. Yeah. You still need to worry about like contextual relevance. You need to worry about yeah. guardrails. You need to pick the right tool for the right job. So that's where we yeah. saw all the uh, features like bedrock model evaluation, guardrails, and uh, embeddings and vector databases that we launched uh, really play a big role in the that. The embedding case was a great, great launch. Thanks for getting that in there. Yeah. And having uh, the right data platform as well is critical to, yeah. to, the, to this. Can you explain? If you had your own LLM, well, explain why it's so important to have all this optionality. Um, that, uh, sure, uh, when you think about this space, um, yeah, we are a strong believer that no one model will uh, rule the world uh, because uh, there is absolutely going to be different models that are going to be uh, right for different use cases and even at different points in time. And uh, because uh, different models have different uh, performance, latency, and uh, accuracy, and cost characteristics, and uh, every application has its relevant uh, ROI. And uh, for instance, internal support uh, uh, IT chat application, where you are answering questions for like maybe 200 documents, you don't need the most capable model where the inference cost is something like uh, $10 for 10 requests. You probably need a highly customizable small model. So, whereas when you're trying to do complex reasoning and automation, you probably need a model that is more capable on those. So that is why we actually always, Bedrock was the first uh, one to come up with the option which is like, hey, it is, you do need a model choice and it is paramount. Uh, and uh, we will help you with uh, dealing with this complexity and we will provide you access to the leading FMs. And if you look at it, uh, the history, when uh, we built RDS and I was the engineer uh, who built it, it had the same roots at the time Every enterprise, old guard enterprise vendor used to say, oh, the answer to all your database is X. It doesn't matter what your question is. And we said, yeah. no, <laughs> actually, RDS, we had multiple engines, and then we still went on to build our own, and it's very yeah. similar here. I was talking with um, Tom Sutterson, who came on earlier, and he says, the people are going to get a lot of love in this next wave is, with Generative AI is the data engineer, the chief data officer, and the network engineer. He says, because his, his point was, now that the developers will have a feeding frenzy on the foundation models yeah. as that developer layer, yeah. they're going to want to have kind of that data as code, yeah. uh, AI as code abstracted away from them. Yeah. And all the pipelining and the data, the data world will be changed. And, yeah. and we were, we've been saying on theCUBE that the data engineering has to get, not reset, but rethought through to feed AI, so building governance in from day one. You had a bunch of announcements we're talking about zero ETL, for instance, and other things. So if this continues, that means there's got to be an engineering exercise under the hood. Yeah. What are you, how do you see that? Is that, are we overthinking this, or do you see radical change around governance and how people should be thinking about their data strategy to, to ride this next 10, 20 year wave? Yeah, I mean, uh, if anything, uh, uh, generative AI uh, makes the data uh, strategy even more important because um, at the end of the day, uh, without actually being able to customize with your data, yeah. generative AI applications are not really going to be useful for your customer and your business. But the key aspect is uh, you still have to solve the traditional problems uh, with uh, having a strong data foundation. You still need to get uh, break down your data silos and uh, have them in high quality. Yeah. You still need to actually make sure you are storing it in a vector database uh, to be able to index. You still need to ensure that you're picking the right tools for the job. But what essentially now, that's why yesterday I was talking about the symbiosis, then how can Gen AI help yeah. to make data engineers even more productive in uh, improving data quality to doing zero ETL to yeah. also querying and uh, Do you see that as a flywheel? Is that, I mean, you guys love flywheels at Amazon, so yeah. the flywheel of, of Gen AI interacting with 
the data, yeah. that's a new flywheel. And human intellect, you mentioned, yeah. mentioned the human, we have data in our head. Uh, right? Actually, so, uh, your, uh, you phrased it uh, really well. That is another way to actually talk about uh, the symbiosis, and it's a very Amazon way of talking <laughs> about it. <laughs> I feel like I work at Amazon after all these years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do agree, because uh, I actually think uh, yeah. data and genea and human, uh, they all facilitate each other to create these remarkable experiences, and uh, because data fuel Gen AI, and uh, cloud and data really led to where Gen AI is what it is, and uh, Gen AI is also going to yeah. uh, make data management a lot easier, and humans, we are the facilitators. You made that point, your keynote too, the human and, and, and AI relation. You and I have talked about this yeah, a yeah. lot, the I mean, greatest chess player in the world is not a machine, it's not yeah. a human, it's a machine and a human. Humans plus AI is greater than AI. You saw that chess is well, well documented, and well, yeah. well uh, argued, by the way, yeah. by, by the chess people, they love to talk yeah. and, and chat. But we were talking, Dave and I, were, and when I asked his question, we noticed that the security team at Amazon is now one team, yeah. and security, we think the security wave, and now this data engineering wave is going to have the same trajectory, somewhat similar in the sense of, creating a developer experience where the developers can just code in line yeah. in the IDE. We heard that with Code Whisperer, we saw that with Q. Of yeah. course, the, the business side is more the, yeah. the answer to the co-pilot, but if, if you believe that, that the, uh, the data has to be highly, highly available, horizontally yeah. scalable, but vertically specialized, which we've been saying for five years, then you kind of rethink the unification of the data. Yeah. And because you have now a complex workloads, as you yeah. mentioned, and a complex topology, yeah. core cloud, cloud on premises, cloud yeah. on edge, cloud in the space. Yeah. Um, you got to have, and we see Health Lake, yeah. you got data lakes uh, yeah. forming centralized things. So is the organization going to be like changing around how you organize your teams and your data? Because it almost seems like it's a reset has to happen. I mean, uh, that is something we are starting to see even in, among um, companies. Uh, titles like CDO didn't exist even four years ago, yeah. and now we CDO is one of the most important jobs in every organization, where they are in charge of breaking down data silos in their organization and figuring out how do you get a unified uh, data platform story, because they know that is absolutely critical to actually yeah. drive ML strategy and like create net new experiences, uh, not only to optimize cost structure, but to create net new customer experiences. And uh, I think uh, that is uh, now more important than ever. Right? Will these verticals have data lakes? I mean, you can imagine, the health lake is an interesting uh, answer. Yeah. I like that one, because that opens up things. Um, security lake. Security lake is another one. You got yeah. security lake. You know. Is there an analog to like the- Telecom the, lake? The, the, well, the, or the Amazon data platforms. I mean, is, yeah. is there, if it's a bigger I mean, challenge, right? The yeah. Data zone become yeah. that sort of? I mean, data zone already actually helps facilitate a lot of these governance, uh, especially because uh, one of the challenges internally within an enterprise is to first ensure, first you are able to catalog what data sets you have, then let alone uh, govern and then also uh, share accordingly and yeah. uh, keep this yeah. flywheel going. And uh, um, this uh, we are continuing to add uh, not just yeah. the analytics, but also the database and the machine learning uh, aspects so that it becomes an end-to-end -end data platform. So the show's ending with a big replay party tonight. As you look back and zoom out, you're kind of yeah. chilling out here in the cube, looked at your keynote. What do you think? I mean, what's your, What's your take on how it went, how do you feel, and what was the coolest thing, most exciting thing that you think came out of all this? I mean, uh, first of all, uh, reInvent is uh, one of my favorite times of the year, so, because uh, if you look at it purely from a um, uh, selfish, uh, from my team perspective, the teams work incredibly hard uh, throughout the year, and then they get to showcase everything they do, yeah. and uh, it's always exciting to, also, not only launch these things, but uh, get uh, customer reactions, uh, and also uh, we get to see how customers are innovating with it, and uh, when I hear some of the stories, like what you heard like from Huron AI, how they are uh, democratizing cancer care in Sub-Saharan Africa, that makes the whole thing worth it, right? Because yeah. we all work like yeah. incredibly yeah. hard, but uh, when you have that kind of impact, and that's what uh, I get, even though reInvent, uh, I probably sleep like only four hours a day, <laughs> but, uh, but I still uh, But I mean, you're a data, you DynamoDB, that's your heritage when you were an intern and it started Amazon, but the data world is like, this is prime time. Yeah. If you're a data person, <laughs> I mean, it's a whole nother level, next, next level. Heaven. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that is what I, it makes 
makes it uh, exciting that uh, now data is more important than ever, AI is more important than ever, and builders are more important than ever. That's why it's <laughs> such a beautiful symbiosis or flywheel, like you put it uh, as well. So, it, will there be a day when we just say, hey, rewrite my schema? <laughs> and it just does it. <laughs> actually, that day may not be in, uh, yeah. uh, too long. Yeah. Actually, I mean, yeah. the demo was a great, 1,000 apps in two hours, and the yeah, dot yeah. and Linux. I mean, yeah. I can imagine like self-building pipelines, uh, automatic intelligence and reasoning around yeah. uh, infrastructure provisioning. Yeah. I mean. I actually think uh, those are the kind of things, uh, almost weird like the world is moving from like when it used to move from assembly to C to C++ <laughs> to Java. Now uh, uh, the undifferentiated heavy lifting constantly keeps yeah. improving. We are in yet another yeah. technological era jump in uh, <laughs> removing the undifferentiated heavy lifting. So we can augment intelligence yeah. to these developers. Well, we appreciate you. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. I know you're super busy. Take time out to reflect. Um, crowds pretty much back to a steady state yeah. of reInvent. I know. 60 plus thousand people. We got the, the right, go stay to the right, go left, try to cross <laughs> over. <laughs> I know, but it is such an exciting uh, yeah. thing to see so many yeah. people, and yeah. uh, it's always good to see you both uh, as well. So thanks for having right. me. Thanks, Swami. Thanks for coming out. Okay, we'll be back with more live coverage here in theCUBE with reInvent. Now, back to Palo Alto Studio where they can take it from here. We'll be right back after this short break.